On joining his prime, the minority in parliament is pushing for the establishment of an independent commission of inquiry to probe the disappearance of the 100 grams of whitish powdery substance suspected to be cocaine. Would immediately do what is important in the circumstances. Set up. Absolutely, yes, to look into the circumstances, uh, you know, in which the 100 grams of cocaine went missing. Also tonight, as controversy over Ghana's slow death rate rages on and misclaims figures are being massaged, the presidency is fighting back, insisting the figures put out by the Ghana Health Service is accurate. The presidency doesn't generate any figures. We see the figures as you have seen here today. And then we then use the figures to plan and monitor whatever is going on. We know the Ghana Medical Association has warned in Ashanti region COVID-19 mortalities could increase if government does not set up a dedicated facility to receive COVID-19 positive patients. Also here on news on Joy News Prime on your election headquarters, we'll hear from the Electoral Commission that is fighting off claims from the minority that it is facing out over 6,000 polling stations in the upcoming mass registration exercise. I've been listening to her, I feel profoundly troubled in my heart for the future of Ghana's democracy. True. The cluster system basically means that when we begin the registration, we are going to start at certain specific registration centers. And coming up later in business. Minister of Finance and GRA launches new tax audits and quality assurance department. Uh, we will step on toes, we will make some honest mistakes, but we will have open doors for dialogue and feedback. We will aggressively venture into uncharted waters, we will be friendly, we will need allies and above all, we will need a support. And later here on Join East Prime, controversial Dodi Pepperson in Quanta Highway developing potholes four years after contractors on the project received presidential praise for doing a great job. You know, this is not what we expected. We thought this road was going to last. Initially, when it was constructed, it was a great relief. We're mainly food growers in this area, and so we need to have roads to transport our goods or our farm produce. My name is Ernest Minu. You are live from our studios here at Kukum Lemley on digital address GA0992539. Also on digital terrestrial TV because we are free to air. This bulletin is also live on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV 144. Please stay with us for details. Hello there, details now. Government confronts skeptics casting doubts regarding the accuracy of COVID-19 data put out by the Ghana Health Service. Presidential Advisor for Health, Dr. Anthony Nsiasari, says the presidency does not generate figures but only relies on the Ghana Health Service data as they provided. Pressure group Occupy Ghana in a statement earlier today stated that there have been more deaths than the health service has so far announced. The information ministry has been holding a news conference to respond to the concern and updating the nation on COVID-19 statistics. But before we get to the details of the news conference, let's go through sections of the press statement uh, from Occupy Ghana uh, on this issue. It says there is... Cause to suspect that death numbers are being massaged. The reported 54 deaths so far cannot be right. For instance, even though 38 deaths have been reported from the Ashanti region alone, less than 20 of those deaths are included in the national count. If the public suspects underreporting, etc., there will be loss of trust in reporting systems that will have consequences that will influence public behavioral responses. Several healthcare workers have been infected and some have died sadly. This points to the sad fact that our doctors and nurses and frontline workers do not have adequate PPEs. Our holding and treatment facilities are running out of space and just a few days ago the special advisor on health at the presidency lamented the fact that we do not have enough critical care staff. We also do not have enough critical beds. Now, we bring you reactions from uh, government following that statement from uh, the Occupy Ghana pressure group. Here's a report by Joseph Akable. 
229 new cases has taken Ghana's case count to 12,193, with deaths rising by 4 to 58. Director General of the Ghana Health Service says some patients are severely ill. As at yesterday, the report we have in the total number of uh, positives are 12,193 cases out of 255,971 persons tested at a positivity rate of 4.76%. We have 4,326 recoveries so far, but we maybe because there's new evidence about the, the behavior of the virus, and so we may be revising, looking at all the events to look at our discharge policy so that we'll be able to uh, get more people of who really do not need our attention no more. We have recorded so far declared 58 uh, deaths. The last four deaths which was added were are all in greater Accra, three males and a female. So that leaves our active cases to about 7,813. Currently there are 13 severe cases with four on who are critical and ventilators. He also explained the inquiry government carries out when a patient dies of the virus. Um, what we are talking about is not about the recovery. The recovery is, a, is more like a viral recovery, which is still the two negatives. What we are talking about is a poly, um, reviewing evidence on discharges. There's evidence, you know, the WHO has come up with three protocols. The first one was in March, there was the second one in April, and the last one, which was on the 27th of May. We are talking about the shedding of the... So if I'm positive, how long does it take me to spread? So they are saying it takes about maximum by 11th day, you are no more shedding the virus. And so if I'm not shedding the virus, should I be in isolation? You are no more a threat. And so we don't have to wait for two negatives before such a person is discharged. If the person is sick and recovers, they are recommending that if you have three more days of no complaints, the person can be discharged from COVID. But if you are there with your hypertension, you can continue managing your hypertension. So these are the things that we are looking at. The presidency doesn't generate any figures. We see the figures as you have seen here today. And then we then use the figures to plan and monitor whatever is going on. We are, we are showing you exactly the regions and the districts where all this, where we are having pro, uh, the COVID-19 cases. So we then target the regions and the districts where we have to send resources there. So I want to repeat once again, we don't generate any figures. We don't manipulate any figures at the presidency or for that matter at the presidential tax force level. Ghana's borders remain shut, but governments have so far allowed some 856 citizens to come into the country on an assisted program. Foreign Minister Shelia Yokobuchi gave some details. The government of Ghana decided to assist in the evacuation of Ghanaians who are stranded abroad owing owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. So far, 856 Ghanaians have been assisted to come back home. Concerns have, however, emerged on the cost of mandatory self-isolation being carried out. She offered this explanation as well as hinting of steps to address the challenge. It is difficult for the task force to get hotels who, that are willing to, for their hotels to be used as, um, for quarantine. That is a major, major problem. And so the hotels that have agreed are the ones that are being used. The logistics to try and, first of all, um, make sure that the health authorities visit them as they, they, they normally would, will be a problem. Also the security services would have to be posted at these um, uh, quarantine centers or these hotels.
Let's go to the phone lines now and do some interrogation on this matter. Uh, we are joined by Kweku Sedbefia, who is a member of Occupy Ghana. Thank you very much, Mr. Sedbefia, for your time here on Join News Prime. Now, two of your claims, one on the numbers and the second one on the issue of space at the treatment centers, have been uh, debunked by the Ghana Health Service and the Presidential Advice on Health. Do you still stand by those claims? Um, absolutely, because, you know, um, what the Director of Health did confirm mm -hmm. was that there were discrepancies between the numbers being churned out by the region and the numbers being churned at the national level. How, how is that? And, uh, please say again. How is that? We had him clearly say that the figures as they put out is what is accurate, and we should go by that. No. What they said was that they needed to validate the results before declaring it at the national level. Mm -hmm. Our accusation was the fact that Ashanti region, for example, um, had turned out 38 deaths. The amount, of, uh, the amount in that number that had been captured by the national system was 20. Mm -hmm. That's a difference of 18 deaths unaccounted for. And to that was a response that they needed to validate to be sure that indeed People that were, uh, you know, they were claiming to have died. But, but validating died the results, the validating the results does not necessarily mean an admission that the figures are being massaged, which is the point you make. Did you listen to the, uh, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, press, the press statements of the minister? He Absolutely. He confirmed the fact that what they were receiving from the regions, they needed to validate. And he did support the idea that, indeed, what could come from the regions could differ from what National was churning out. Our contention no, no. was this, that if you were, uh, if the number of infections coming from the region were accepted and reflected as such on the national platform, and then the number of recovery also had the same effect, mm. they were also accepted. Mm. Why were the number of the dead different? This was really our contention. And our contention was in line with the fact that we needed to find out if indeed government really planned for us to live with the virus or whether he really wanted to aggressively deal Mr. with Sedbefi, it. Mr. Sedbefi, I'm and sorry, but there. you made a categorical accusation, and, and that is to say that the figures were being massaged by government. Now, what the Director General of the Ghana Health Service is saying that we may need to validate some of the figures being churned out by the regions to add them on to the national figures. That is not an admission that the figures are being massaged. But did you know, did you know of this validation until now? If we hadn't even raised the issue, how would you even know that these figures were being validated? Mm -hmm. This had never come up until we raised those concerns. Okay. And the concerns weren't because we cooked up the numbers. The concerns were because Ashanti Raging has accurately reported 38 COVID-19 deaths. Mm -hmm. That is what Ashanti Raging has done. Okay. okay. And the national system only accounts for 20 of that. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's within our remit and our mandate to question the figures if the region from which the data is coming from says it's 38 and national says it's 20. It is only when we raised those issues that they came up with the idea that, look, we needed to validate all the deaths to find out if indeed they were COVID-19 deaths or not. You've been hearing the term being bandied out around that these people or some people were dying simply because they had um, underlying health conditions. Yeah. So far, we haven't heard that a single person died purely from COVID-19 and nothing else. But that's obviously because the virus already messes up people's, uh, uh, you know, how do you call it, their immune system. And so whatever else that you have that is under there is what will kill you. We don't buy that idea at all mm -hmm. because up until now, we hadn't even heard that numbers were being validated to find out if uh, people were dying of the virus or not. But here's the thing I'm throwing at you. Mm -hmm. If you already know the number of people who are infected and you have, let's say, A, B, C people on the list of uh, people who, are, who have tested positive for the virus, and then there's 58 of those people on your list who have died. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it therefore assume that those people probably died from the virus? Why then do you only accept 20 of them and leave out 18? Only for us to start questioning you and then you come up with the idea that those extra 18 were figures that you were validating. Now, put that alongside the idea that government is held on having JHS 3 students, SHS final year students write exams. Doesn't it make sense, therefore, that probably the reason why these numbers aren't coming up all of a sudden or as soon as the, you know, the regions turn them out is so that it becomes easier for us to all accept that 
things are business is, you know, uh, mm -hmm. pretending as usual. I, 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 I want you to hold the line briefly for me, Mr. Sedefia. Let's do some quick check in, Kumasi. We're joined by Ohimin Teria, who is a member of our health Dex. Ohimin, you've been cross checking the figures as far as the death toll in the Ashanti region is concerned. What do we know? By the Ghana Health Service, that's the Ashanti Regional Health Directorate, mm -hmm. uh, dated 13 June 2020, C12 number 65. The death toll, that is a COVID 19 related deaths in Ashanti region, uh, stood at 38. And the report uh, compiled uh, by the Regional Health Directorate uh, mentioned Kumasi uh, Metro with 24 deaths. Obwasi Municipal uh, 2, Obwasi East 2, Oforukrum 1, Amansia South uh, District 1, Asoka Municipal 1, Old Tafo Municipal 2, and then Ejuso 1, Afijapabri South 2, Amansia Central 1, and then Adanse uh, North District also uh, with one reported uh, death. Uh, so uh, these are a situation, situational report mm -hmm. compiled by the regional health directorate and sent to the national headquarters on daily basis. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the editors, the editors are the regional uh, health director, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Tinkran, uh, his de two deputies, uh, Dr. Yao Ofori Yabua and Dr. Rita Larson Randolph, and two other officials from the Ashanti Regional Health Directorate. Mm. And if you look at uh, the report uh, compiled, uh, it tells you that as at 13th uh, June 2020, five deaths were recorded, making the number of deaths 38 in the Ashanti region. Well, I mean, thank you very much for bringing us up to speed on the situation in the Ashanti region as far as the COVID-19 death toll is concerned. We still have on the line the uh, member of Occupy Ghana, uh, Kweku Sedbefia. Now, you make other claims as well as far as the reagents at the various testing centers is concerned. How do you back the claim that they, they are running out of the reagents, which is causing the delay in the testing? Well, we've, we've been speaking to um, health professionals, we've been speaking to uh, administrators of hospitals, and if you remember, uh, many, many months ago when all this started and we began to complain and make noise about, you know, the lack of PPEs and all of these things, government came out and said, no, it, they were not true, those things were in. And so there's always been this back and forth between us and government on what the situation on the ground is. But we are reliably informed that that is the situation, that in a lot of the hospitals or in some of the hospitals, um, they've had to, you know, create makeshift uh, accommodations because of all these things that are happening. And we, we thought it was important to draw government's attention to that fact. But we need to focus really on why we're doing this. Ultimately, we want answers. And the answers we need is this. What are we doing? Are we aggressively trying to bring the disease down or do we uh, do, uh, do aim for herd immunity? Mm -hmm. If we're aiming for herd immunity, then of course it makes sense to uh, you know, re uh, uh, how do you call it, lift the uh, restrictions. It makes sense to open schools or begin a conversation towards opening schools. And it makes sense to do this because you're looking out for head immunity. You're hoping that a lot of people will catch the disease. Um, most of them will live and develop antibodies to it. A few mm. will die. This is really what we will be looking at if we really were. So, so these are some of the questions that you're seeking answers from, from the Ghana Health Service. And I want to thank you very much, uh, Kweku Sadbefia, for joining us here on Join East Prime. We're working the lines to see if we can get the Ghana Health Service to help us understand some of these figures and also the discrepancies that we are seeing from the Ashanti region. But we stay in the Ashanti region because the Ghana Medical Association is warning that COVID-19 mortalities there could increase if government does not step up a dedicated facility to receive positive patients. Regional President of the GMA, Dr. Parkwe Sibedu, reveals Confanochi Teaching Hospital is now receiving COVID-19 positive patients on the wards, a situation he says is increasing the risk of infection. He also hints more doctors at the hospital are getting infected due to the lack of personal protective equipment. The situation here is dire at the moment and the 
accident and emergency center which you see behind me is the source of referral for many hospitals across uh, the region and even beyond so we have emergency cases coming here all the time the situation is really bad if you look at the statistics from the ghana health service um, you realize most of the deaths are from here and if you get to our hospital you realize if you pass through the accident and emergency unit, you realize that they are expanding the holding area. Now um, you go, previously we used to have the holding area and then um, those who come back confirmed are subsequently transferred to the HIU, as we call it, at the other side of the hospital. But now there is a spillover. You get it, patients are, who have tested positive are being kept at the main hospital at the emergency on the wards and that is that is the situation in addition you realize that um aside the system being under so much pressure we have most of our colleagues getting infected and i'm saying this because um, we we of the ghana medical association are collating the data on number of doctors who have gotten infected in the line of duty and so we know the actual numbers and i am saying this on authority that so many of our patients of our colleagues not some um, um, doctors alone but nurses and other staff are getting the infection how, put a figure to it how many are we talking about yeah on the last count as i said we're still gathering the data um, on the national level we have close to 80 doctors we're collecting the, um, the, 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 the number of patients um, doctors who have it. I'm sure in the course of the week or next week we'll get you the actual analysis of the doctors. But here, um, per my last count, it will be close to 15, 20 of our colleagues in this hospital. And as I said, um, we're collating the data on them. And that's how come I know the actual numbers. Mm. Now, you said that there is a spillover of patients. Um, how do you mean when you say that? You know, previously for every institution, we have holding areas and then we have the treatment centers. Um, when you come to Konfonochi, we used to have a holding area, which is a place they designated under the disaster building. I'm sure if you pass there, you see it. And then once your results comes and you are, um, you've tested positive, you are moved to Poly. We have the, the highly infectious units where they treat. You have everything set up. But then the holding areas are full, and as we're talking now, we have patients who are kept at the accident and emergency unit. These are actual patients who have confirmed, um, the test confirms um, as COVID. So you go to the accident and emergency unit, that's the situation now. And uh, the danger in that? You know, um, I don't want to overemphasize this, but you realize that we know the mode of transmission and we know because it's highly infectious that's why we have isolation centers but then if you are um, keeping those who have already tested positive in a ward containing other patients who have other conditions one there's the risk of transmission because you see all the staff entering right if the positive patient is confirmed, the patient is confirmed positive and they are moved there, whoever is entering that unit should be fully protected. Still in the Ashanti region, about 200 workers of the Kwadasu SDA hospital in Kumasi are undergoing COVID-19 tests after the hospital's medical director died of the disease. Some of the personnel are believed to have come into contact with the late 48-year-old doctor, Harry Owusubwaten, who passed on Saturday, I am interior of our health decks has more in the following report. Director of Ghana Adventist Health Services, Dr. Paul Amocheme, confirmed the sad news to Joy News. He explained a test on the late physician after his death proved positive for COVID-19 with what he describes as underlying conditions. It is true that the medical director or medical superintendent at Kwadaso SD Hospital in Kumasi has passed away on the 13th june 2020 when the news was reported to us a team was dispatched to take a sample 
to test, to establish what might have led to the demise. And uh, when the results came, it was established that it was due to COVID-19, yet would underline health or medical conditions. Adventist health authorities are collaborating with the Ashanti Regional and Kwadaso Municipal Health Directories to test all hospital staff. He assured of public safety and good quality care, asked the hospital's premises is fumigated and under preventive protocols strictly enforced. We've put in all the necessary measures in place to screen them pre-triaging and others. We strongly believe that some of our workers may be at risk and uh, for them to be on the safer side, it will be more expedient to test them all. So we've tested more than 200 workers. We've also fumigated the hospital and now work is ongoing. Late Dr. Boatin, described by colleagues as hard-working physician, had been working with the Quadraso SDA Hospital since 2013. His demise has come as a shock to the medical fraternity and the public, especially patients who have experienced his work. Though some of the hospital staff have recorded positive COVID-19 cases, Dr. Boatin has become the first deaf casualty at the facility. This is not the first time, but this is the first time that we have experienced a death from COVID in our facility. During the COVID uh, pandemic, this, we put measures in place that every two weeks we test our staff to make sure that we are safe so that we can also take care of those who seek our services. So we provided all the necessary precautions and the offensive prevention control measures put in place to help the facility and our staff. From Kumasi, Ohimi Interior reporting. I have more COVID-19 stories for you, but this one may put a smile on your face. There appears to be hope on the horizon for people living with COVID-19. Researchers in the UK say a cheap, widely available drug can help save the lives of patients seriously ill with coronavirus. Officials say the low-dose steroid treatment, dexamethasone, is a major breakthrough in the fight against the deadly virus. But what more do we know about this drug? Let's go onto, the, onto Zoom now and speak to a pharmacist. Kwame Sapon Esiedu, he joins us. Thank you very much for your time here on Join News Prime. First, should we be celebrating already the establishment of this drug as a potential cure for COVID-19? Well, Mr. Esiedu, I guess you have to unmute. I think you have muted uh, your sound there. If you can unmute so we can hear you. Yeah, hello. Yes, Thank we can you. hear you now. Can you go ahead, sir? Um, it's a very difficult one for me because the story that run before you ask me this question. Mm -hmm. Someone I've known from childhood. Okay. Someone I grew up with. Someone I swam with. Someone I attended university with. Someone I attended primary school with. Someone whose elder brother I sat in the same classroom with when I got back to Ghana from England as a kid. So for me, that's the reality of COVID. Harry's death is a wake-up call for all of us. And for anyone who grew up on the campus of KMUSD, then USD, at the time I was growing up, between 1979 and 1989, having said that, and thinking of his soul and wanting his soul to rest in peace, I would say that dexamethasone is not something to be celebrated, not because it is not a breakthrough, mm -hmm. but it's what I call an adjunct okay. to the management of COVID. It's not a cure. It is what in health we call a modulator to one of the main killers due to COVID, which is the cytokine storm. And when that happens, your body recognizes your organs, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys as foreigners. Okay. And then the army of your body, which is the immune system starts attacking it. Mm -hmm. And what dexamethasone does 
is to break this chance of your body attacking your immune system okay. and stopping the cytokine storm. So yes, it is a brilliant breakthrough. But the most important thing I want to say is that for people in Ghana, if anything, you need to be celebrating those at the forefront of managing this COVID fight. Okay. Because they've already been treating COVID and managing COVID with an agent of dexamethasone called prednisolone, and in some instances, methylprednisolone, mm. which may probably be a reason why our death rate, albeit the issues around our, is our data correct, mm. might be slightly lower than the world average. Mm. average. Mm. And so that is how I'd want to situate this conversation. Mm. Uh, and would you say the steroid we are using is uh, much better than what uh, the UK is telling us now, dexamethasone? I wouldn't say it's better or worse. It is actually in the same family. Okay. So when you talk of medicines, you're always talking about what we call those relations. So you probably would give dexamethasone at something like 2 milligrams and give prednisolone at 25 milligrams. But you get the same dose response, mm -hmm. which then means that you get the same outcome in the case that you prevent death. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, the side effects would not be any different irrespective of the dose because they are yeah. drugs in the same family. Now, for purposes of education, we saw what happened with uh, chloroquine, with vitamin C, when it was announced as part of treatment for COVID-19. How available is this drug on the market? And if someone is listening to us or watching us right now who wants to get this, uh, what would be your advice to that person? Don't go and get it. This is a prescription-only medication. It's not a medication that needs to be managed with the layman. Okay. It needs to be managed with a health professional in direct control of the medication. Mm. The biggest issue with COVID is not to get the disease and try and self-medicate, mm. which is what I want to expunge based on this conversation. The biggest issue is about preventing yourself from getting infected, avoiding the infection requires social distancing. It requires washing your hands. It requires wearing your face mask. It requires using your sanitizers. It Absolutely. requires avoidance of crowds. Mm. That is the key issue. What is being put out, which I say already is happening in Ghana, is the fact that should you get infected and should you have comorbidities and should you go into crisis, yeah. there is now a bigger understanding of a medicine that can actually decrease your chances significantly of losing your life. Absolutely, and which is what uh, researchers in the UK great. are actually telling us. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kwame Siedisapon, thank you very much for your time here on Join Us Prime. We appreciate the education you've given us on, on dexamethasone, which is uh, being you know, claimed as a very good cure for uh, COVID-19. Not a cure exactly, but part of the medication for patients who've tested positive for COVID-19. He joined us from the UK and we are grateful. You're watching Johnny's Prime with me and Asmini. We're taking a break. When we return, the Electoral Commission is fighting off claims from the minority that it is facing out 6,000 polling stations in the upcoming mass registration exercise. Having listened to her, I feel profoundly troubled in my heart for the future of Ghana's democracy. Through the cluster system basically means that when we begin the registration, we are going to start at certain specific registration centers. You have details of this plus the latest in business after this break. Stay with us.
evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Sinamapeno. I'm here for business. In our first story tonight, Ghana's cocoa regulator, Cocoa Board, has described recent report by Bloomberg on their struggle to pay cocoa farmers as inaccurate. The Bloomberg report indicated that Cocoa Board is struggling to pay purchasing agents for being bought from cocoa farmers as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Charles Aite engaged the head of corporate affairs at Cocoa Board, Fifi Boafo, on these figures and the state of the company amid the pandemic. According to Bloomberg, the arrears of Cocoa Board to cocoa farmers was as high as 1.2 billion cities, a development which questions Cocoa Board's viability amid the coronavirus pandemic. Head of Corporate Affairs for Cocoa Board, Fifi Boafo, argued that only three out of 54 cocoa buying companies are yet to be paid by the regulator. It's not a case to say that we are struggling so much that we are unable to pay these companies. Yes, we made some payment to the three companies I'm referring to just last month and our expectation is that by close of week we'll pay the three companies everything we owe them in full. So it's not a case that we are struggling and we are not finding solution as to how to pay these companies. So far there are concerns over the fate of the $1.3 billion cocoa syndication loan looking at the turn of events. Cocoa Board believes accessing the syndication for the next cocoa crop season will not be affected in any way. Obviously this is a time we would expect that we have gone to do our road show but uh, because of COVID like the president said we are not in normal time so the normal way of doing things has changed a little bit but we are on course and our expectation is that we will be able to uh, raise the money needed for our operations next year so yes we are on course the figure that was initially pegged has not changed we are still working with the same figure of course if it happens that based on our projections something would change we shall communicate it but as i speak to you today that has not changed the coronavirus pandemic has had an effect on the global value chain of cocoa while difficult to estimate future import and export sales the pandemic more broadly is biting hard on a sector that already contributes up to 10 percent of ghana's gdp the Minister of Finance and the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority have launched a new tax audit and quality assurance department aimed at improving the audits of Ghana's tax regime. Finance Minister Ken Ofriata is optimistic the department will deepen confidence in taxpayers, especially when COVID-19 is eroding revenue margins. There's more in the following report. Finance Minister Ken Oforiata decried the low level of confidence by taxpayers in the service rendered by auditors on tax returns. He believes the Tax Audit and Quality Assurance Department will go a long way to address these outstanding issues. We will make these changes and I, I really um, would like to um, acknowledge Commissioner General for this bold step. Uh, we will step on toes, we will make some honest mistakes, but we will have open doors for dialogue and feedback. We will aggressively venture into uncharted waters, we will be friendly, we will need allies, and above all, we will need the support of all Ghanaians, all revenue um, due to the state. On his part, Commissioner General of the GRA, Amisha Dayawusu Amwa, stated that the GRA will leverage on the Tax and Audit Assurance Department to expand the tax net and improve revenue generation. We will also make use of, it, of data such that we ensure that we'll be able to match our data from one um, government agency into our system, from one government agency into both the domestic and the uh, customs system to ensure that at any point in time, if there's somebody who is, uh, has a database in DVLA, it's at the same time being able to pay the equivalent of whatever is demonstrating DVLA in taxes. Showing that certain returns can be filed and payments made directly into the account, but there are challenges. But that has its challenges. For example, it is sometimes difficult for the GRA to determine the type of tax for which payment was made and, in addition, the period for which the payment was made. And the Chamber of Pharmacy Ghana and Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association are threatening to withdraw services to some medical stores across the country. When I come back after 8 p.m., I have the details for you in business. Thanks so much for watching.
It's a pleasure to come your way with the sports on Prime. I'm Oreku Ampofo. Let's now do some women's football news. And the GFA Executive Council has appointed now defunct Normalization Committee member Na Odofole and Madame Habiba Ataforsen to provide a roadmap for the game in the country. CEO of Bridge City Cleopatra and Kitia has been speaking to my colleague Susan Owusu-Ansa and she filed this report. Following the global pandemic, which brought sports and events in the country to a halt, the GFA Executive Council took advantage of the lack of activities to reveal the image of women's football in Ghana. In a meeting last week, the GFA appointed now defunct normalization committee member, now Odofole Norte, an executive council member, Habiba Ataforsen, to provide a roadmap for the women's game. CEO of Rich City Women FC and a member of the Women's League Board, Cleopatra Insian Ketia offered suggestions on the three core things the two member team must recommend to the association. First of all, grassroots football, grassroots football, grassroots football. I think it's the favorite thing that any footballer likes to say, grassroots football, coaches, everybody. And the reason why I mention grassroots football is because if we don't pay attention to grassroots football, if we don't pay attention to the bottom of the, the, the food chain, if we don't pay attention to that, football isn't going to go anywhere, both in the men's side and the women's side. We are noticing that if you watch football, we're always laughing about how people are changing their age. It's because we never paid attention to the grassroots football. But I think that if we can have an army of girls who from age five started learning how to play football, we will start to do better when they get to the national team, when they get to the, the black queens. The second thing is the facility. Women don't have anywhere to train and play football. Of course, yeah, there are Sakura parks, there are grass pitches, there are places to play football. But it's not good that we need the most in women's football, the market and the brand and the packaging. If women's football is not something that can be marketed, there's nothing that we do that can help us in any way. Fine, we have the girls playing, we have the facilities there, but if we don't brand it and we don't package it in such a way that people will be interested in it, the girls' careers will never go anywhere. She believes there's a disparity between women and men's football in Ghana. That must be bridged with the right initiatives. The women's clubs that are, are trying their best, but nobody knows anything about them. I myself didn't know much about women's football in Ghana until I got into it. And I realized that, listen, there's a gap, there's a space there, there's something that's missing. And I could sit down and tweet about it and complain about how the GFA isn't doing anything, about how people aren't doing anything about it, or I can get involved myself and do what I can do about it. My last word is, well, give women's football a chance. Let's see what, we can, ha what, what can happen if we focus on women's football and, and then just try to give it a chance. So, yeah. The Women's League second round was about resuming before the outbreak of COVID-19. The recommendations are expected to influence the image of women's football when the game resumes. Premier League, it is Project Restart. For Manchester City, it would look like Project Impossible as they trail Liverpool by 25 points. Could they possibly perform a miracle and climb Liverpool? We would see as time definitely would tell. But that wraps it up for the first part of the sports segment here on Prime. My name is Eric Wampofo and do remember to stay safe. And it's time for Showbiz and Caddy's here with the very latest. Hello, Caddy. Hi. Looking gorgeous as usual. Thank you. What do you have for us today? Okay, so around last year, end of last year, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Drew and Creamy, uh, they released a song, Jet, which features uh, Sarkodie. And there was yeah, this whole... Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. There was this whole controversy. I just want to sing it so my producer knows I know it. You know that song this time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so there was this, you know, controversy around the song and... Her songs came out to say that, oh, I produced the song, I wrote the song, mm -hmm. um, because he's a former signee of Highly Spiritual. And Creamy and Mr. Jew, they are currently you okay. know, signed under Highly Spiritual, and he's saying that they wrote the song. So was this whole controversy. Now, this evening, on a fear quite so with um, Jerry Justice, Jew is here, and he's saying that all the controversy around the song helped promote the song. He also revealed that he had no idea Sarkodie was on the song till after everything was done. There's more in this interview. Watch. Let's talk about this hit song with you and Creamy and then um, 
Eh, for instance, sack or the can't hold store in a crash. I mean, a eh, chassis, eh, say. Okay, uh, in Tina, many uh, creamy were UK, mm -hmm. uh, Ghana music was UK. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, K was sending a beat. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, in the day, on your elbow beat now, mm -hmm. no, I send them my search, I work on it. Mm -hmm. By eh, first time, were UK in Tina, a young shame, like a yet as a young team, poor yet a chin, yet chin, more boga, a meat. Jai, so uh, later you back again. I don't know. Catch us. Charlie Christmas about. I was saying release a banger with you. Mm -hmm. Now nah, he's had the vision about it. Into opese ye young wejuma. You understand? Uh, Into from a whole many creamy. He throw different different verses. Mm -hmm. But on my guidelines. Oh, you understand? Okay. Say Charlie, me pese ye ye say. Mm -hmm. And uh, whilst I was in school, no, na ye ye jama bi say. I could say, J, 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 what you are saying. So I guideline it there. So I guideline it there. Was a so I line it there. Was a boom, mom and patch up. So the rest was just me and creamy. And I, I try to try a verses. And I, from there, no, so I could get parts in the name. You need more shame. Just a key idea. One can't share and put. So it came as a surprise to you. As guys. a surprise, mm. trust me, not yet. You expect to put. Wow. I was thinking that it was just going to be me and then many creamy. Mm. But later now, I was saying, and you know, I said, ah, I said, my thing, I'm going to start to know. It's not me. It's not me. It's probably a mistake. Uh, yeah. It's starting to your thing, huh? Mm. But later, no question, I tell you, so it's not me. Ah, 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 So, so now, uh, after now, and you know, Buy you in a mouth for a filly filling up a hundred semi bar by now. A bit of crass, oh, there be my bark. We are no way, no matter that. Not feeling it the same. Oh, this answer made a name, Miss Rick. A crack, eh, cause yes, no, 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 which is Black Lives Matter. Yeah, and I yeah, think that still. we have to look at how to solve this issue. Yeah. And it's also sparked another um, campaign in the UK as well. Yeah, it has. Kadi, thank you very much for bringing us the latest in the world of showbiz. Now, this is your election headquarters. <laughs> The Electoral Commission is fighting off claims that it is facing out over 6,000 polling stations in the upcoming mass registration exercise. The EC boss, Jean Mansa, appeared before the Special Budget Committee of Parliament to brief members on preparation towards the upcoming December polls. Speaking uh, to the media shortly after the meeting, Minority Leader Harina Jisu said the Commission has no legal justification to scrap the 6,300 polling stations in the creation of a new register. I just like to share with you three important observations. One, having listened to her, I feel profoundly troubled in my heart for the future of Ghana's democracy. And I feel disappointed that in her answers, two questions at the committee level. She made two significant worrying statements that the people of Ghana must know. To paraphrase her words, they intend to phase out the registration exercise in some 6,300 registration centers out of the 33,000 registration centers across the country. That troubles my heart because Article 42 will not be observed in essence through making available to Ghanaian people a legitimate and guaranteed right they are entitled to under Article 42.
But Deputy EC Chair, uh, Chairman Dr. Bosman Asari responding to the claims described the minority leader's claim as inaccurate. Dr. Asari explained that the Commission is rather ruling out the exercise in phases where EC officials would be required to move from one cluster to another cluster to register period with people within the specific period. The registration is in phases. When we begin phase one, we are going to tackle 20% of the registration centers. Phase two, 20%, phase three, 20%, phase four, 20%, phase five, 20%. And that gives us 100%. Then when we finish all, and we also will have a mop-up. So that's basically what we are doing. So nothing has changed from the previous announcements the commission made. It's not true. The cluster system basically means that when we begin the registration, we are going to start at certain specific registration centers. After six days, we move to the next cluster. So what this means is that every registration center will be attended to. Meanwhile, the majority leader of Sir Chairman Sabons insists the commission articulated in clear terms how it intends to carry out the exercise. He also questioned why the minority would push for the chairperson to appear before the plenary in spite of what he described as a comprehensive explanation from the commission. We were put to them at the special budget committee and they answered eloquently and precisely all questions that were posed to them, including matters relating to procurement and they asking for value for money and so on. All questions were answered and at the end of it all, all they could say was that, well, even though you've stated this to us, we just want to put on record that we are against what we want to do. If you are against what he wants to do, why then are you saying that we want to invite you to, to the head the committee? Because after explanations have been proffered to all the questions that were asked, and those answers were very satisfactory, you then end up by saying that, well, in spite of what you have done, uh, my party officially is against what you are doing. Is that, is that sustainable? And then, <laughs> on account of that, then we are saying that, okay, we are inviting you to uh, the, the, the committee of the whole. I'm not too sure that the commission has anything to hide. If there is a determination made to that effect, and they have to come, so be it. But let it not be stated, because, you know, previously, on the floor, he was making the point that I was shielding the commission from appearing before the committee of the whole. Today, I asked them, they should give me one example of any time when in the first quarter of a year, after the budget of the commission has been approved, the commission has appeared before us. It's never happened. And yet, you see, I don't know what is happening. Let's go back to Parliament. The minority is pushing for the establishment of an independent commission of inquiry to probe the disappearance of over 100 grams of whitish powdery substance suspected to be cocaine. The minority said a confusion and blame game between the Customs Division and the Ghana Revenue Authority and personnel from the Narcotics Control Commission on which institution should be held liable points to the fact that some top officials may have been compromised. Ranking member on the Defense and Interior Committee, James Ogaga, believes a full-blown investigation would unravel circumstances leading to the disappearance of the cocaine. Mr. Ogaga has been speaking with my colleague, Chrissy Parker Wilson. Minority's attention has actually been drawn to the um, confusion between the Narcotics Control Commission and the Customs uh, Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority over the laws of some hundred grams of cocaine. The fact that this country in the past had been on the spotlight for, as, as, as a transit point for drug trafficking, we came to notice as a country in the wake of the 77 parcels that went missing when the MV Benjamin some time ago brought in those substances. When um, some cocaine was swapped, substituted, with flour at the CID headquarters. All these things have happened. Even in our courts, cocaine was swapped with uh, soda. soda. Mm -hmm. uh, you see? And so one would have thought that um, these things would not happen again. 
because at every moment when this country was confronted with um, issues surrounding cocaine, committees of inquiry were set up to investigate the circumstances surrounding the laws of um, cocaine and who must have um, been the mastermind of all these things. Recommendations were made and um, implemented and so on and so forth. We recently reenacted the um, law, the Narcotics Control Commission uh, law came into force not too long ago. I mean, this was done to strengthen the hand of the narcotics, what used to be the Narcotics Control Board, now it's a commission, so that it can do its work in a way that would rid this country of the um, scourge of what? Drug trafficking, the issues, the fallouts, and so on. Unfortunately, it appears the security agencies are not collaborating amongst themselves. So how could one security, how could one security agency impede the work of another security agency in the manner that we are told uh, happened at Aflau? I mean, it is unacceptable. And so, Paka, the minority, God willing, tomorrow, we would have a media encounter. And um, we are taking this matter very seriously. It is our, our, our expectation that government would immediately do what is important in the circumstances. You mean by set up, up on, on the, on Absolutely, the yes. To look into the circumstances, uh, you know, in which the 100 grams of cocaine went missing. Well, it's four years today since Johnny spoke the story of how a Burkina Bay contractor who contracted constructed the roads from Dodi Pepeso to Inquanta gifted former President John Mahama a Ford vehicle. The story raised questions over possible conflict of interest that the then President uh, John Mahama may have found himself in. Even though the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice cleared Mr. Mahama of bribery allegations, the issue went on to dominate the headlines in the run-up to the election. Now, today, John News revisited a road at the center of the scandal. My colleague, Justice Beidou, is in the OT region, uh, where the project is, and sent us this report. This is Mkwanta, a busy town in the OT region. It's Monday, a market day. Once upon a time, the road leading to this town was on more trouble. In April 2016, the story changed, but not quite. Malam Farid was one of the laborers hired to work on the road. He now works as a driver and has lived in Mkwanta all his life. You know, this is not what we expected. We thought this road was going to last. Initially, when it was constructed, it was a great relief. We're mainly food growers in this area, and so we need to have roads to transport our goods or our farm produce. Back then, it could take us a whole week just to get to Accra. Now you can live at night, and before morning, you should be in Accra. And so, it was a big relief. This road even has an underground tunnel where pedestrians could cross without needing a zebra crossing. Today, four years on, things are falling apart. <laughs> They created an underpass as part of this road, but it has not been maintained. We used to sell under it when it rains. As you can see, it is now choked. The people who used to clean it have all been sacked by the new government because we were told they belong to the other party. A good part of this road is still in good condition. It's smooth with 
beautiful markings and directional signposts. You are tempted to speed until this happens. Your material, your stone base, your notable in front of stone base, some stone base, you know. And what you say, and Sana Ebe, you know, a new concept starch, Eba at the same notable or a disability claim. I was hiding, I was sent to Mosibu, one of the children. A moon is a claim when you're the infimo, Emma Ninka, a buono, Senior Senke, you know. They did not save the stones from the clay. So much of the road was made with clay. A lot of the cars that use this road are heavy duty vehicles and so the road cannot stand the weight of the load on them at the so yeah na ha dwene and the clay no man yen free sa stone base no no and no any this a problem see here e the aba many parts of the 4 year old road are breaking up very fast and after the pump and pageantry at its opening the people are not sure if it was all worth it I expected this current government to fix the potholes, but they have also allowed the road to deteriorate. It's a safe, we're not part of this country, Ghana. Mr. Mahama in April 2016 said this road was one of the best in the country and had asked local road contractors to learn from how it had been built. But four years on, residents are wondering if it is the lack of maintenance that has left the road in the state or that the contractors simply did a shoddy job. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Nkwanta. Now, the calls for a focus on behavioral change has soared as several people continue to defy the wearing of face masks despite consistent messages on its importance for people to stay safe from contracting coronavirus. President Ekufado has moved from persuasion to force when he directed that wearing of face masks should be mandatory. This directive will be backed by an executive instrument, making it an offense not to wear the masks. Well, it has been about 48 hours since the announcement, but a drive through the central business district show people are not budging. PT now Safo has more in this report. A trader at the central business district insists she has a face mask, yet for close to five minutes, she frantically combs through the pockets of her apron for the mandatory material. She heaves a sigh after finding she has a sanitizer. It is two days since the president announced that leaving homes without masks is an offense. A good number in the large trade area go about activities with their faces naked to the threat of pandemic in the air. For others, including a few children engaged in sales, the cost of face masks is just out of their purchasing power. Others who do have the face mask seem to wear it only for a few minutes, exposing their faces to the risk of droplets in the air. The conditions, they say, are uncomfortable. Social distancing is better at the various stores as compared to pre-COVID times. However, as the grounds offer a one-stop shop for clothes, food and electronics, a few corners experience the heat of crowds coming in or leaving for home. But with relaxed standards in protecting faces and noses practiced by some individuals here, it may be a matter of time till trade goes beyond commodities to a health risk the nation cannot afford at the moment. With the rising toll of death, every life matters. Every droplet is a threat. Join News urges you to keep your mask on at all times. Work. Do what you must safely. 
stay alive. And there are growing concerns about how pregnant women are shying away from the hospitals over fears of contracting the virus and infecting the unborn babies. In a bid to protect expectant mothers and their babies, the Greater Accra Regional Hospital has rolled out a comprehensive protocol, including the creation of three isolation rooms for expectant mothers. The new protocol, which includes the prioritization of COVID-19 tests for expectant mothers who are visiting the facility for the first time, is to reassure them about the hospital environment that it is safe for them. Latifi G says more in this report. The WHO has prescribed a one meter distance as part of the precautionary measures to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. But what if you cannot keep that distance? or you are unable to keep any distance at all. That is the grim reality for babies lying in the womb of mothers who have tested positive for the virus. Acting head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Ridge Hospital, who took me on a tour at the facility, Dr. Kwabna Omari Yabua says, the new protocol, including the creation of isolation rooms, are inspired by the facility's commitment to protect pregnant women. That is the call we are making to the public, that particularly the pregnant women, don't stay home with the fear that when we go there, we will have uh, COVID. Because we've put in, in place measures to deal with them, to protect them, particularly our pregnant women, because you can't postpone pregnancy, you can't postpone delivery. And so we don't want the situation where, because of COVID, we have mortalities due to other conditions. And so we expect that people, when they are sick, when they have a challenge, particularly pregnant women, will come in. And when they come, we expect that the measures that we have put in place, they support us to implement it so that it will protect them, it will protect us, and it will protect their relations as well. And what Dr. Omari didn't add is that you can't postpone labor as well as an expectant mother. Of course. With increasing level of apprehension among expectant mothers, administrator at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, Dr. Emmanuel Strefano says the facility has a protocol that is trigger ready to accommodate expectant mothers who may test positive for the virus. The system is quite ready uh, in the sense that we have a room. First of all, we have a, a system that we call the pre-triage. So we will not allow you to mingle with the people before your, the initial screening questions are asked. So at that point, if there is a, a reason to suspect that you may have the condition, we will not allow you to mingle with the other people. From there, we will send you to what we call the holding center, or a room that has been designated within the maternity department, which we call the holding center, and you'll be all by yourself in that room, but staff in appropriate gear, appropriate PPE can come to you and manage you. Director of Institutional Care at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Samuel Kaba Korea says the protocol by RICH is to instill trust in the health facilities. We've prioritized testing for them, and that is um, if once we label it that pregnant or labor, uh, you get your results very quick for two reasons. One is to make sure that they get the service as fast as possible, and second, to make sure that they are well protected. And they take all the necessary measures to protect the pregnant woman and then the newborn. Because one of the things we don't want is people to lose trust in our health facilities. Obstetrician, gynecologist, and member of the Family Health Division of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Chris Opokufufie, tells me the unit is preparing for the worst case scenario. Some of our preventive measures we hope are working well. We might not get into that grim picture that uh, others might be uh, forecasting. Notwithstanding, we are preparing for the worst, and, and that means we are streamlining or we are maximizing our potential. When, the, when I say that, what I mean is that within our health facilities, we are putting in structures so that women who come to deliver will still be safe at any given time. As far as authorities at the Greater Accra Hospital are concerned, their facility and many other health facilities remain the safest place for expectant mothers to visit. Chief Executive of the Intercity STC, Nana Kumia, is calling for the introduction of a new law which will require passenger vehicles to be uh, fitted with speed limiters. Now, he believes this will help reduce the road traffic accidents. His company has already installed speed limiters 
which has helped, in further, uh, helped further improve the safety on our roads. He spoke to John News after the STC commissioned its new vehicle testing and licensing center at the headquarters here in Accra. Yeah, I mean, this is the newest facility for roadworthy uh, vehicle testing for roadworthy. And as you can see, it's state-of-the-art equipment. Um, the catchment area is very good. We are in the middle of the city, right next to Nkrumah Circle, which is really a hub for com commercial transport and even private transport. So the location is excellent, it's accessible to a lot of motorists. And then we also have facility for buses, passenger vehicles. Uh, this is probably the only facility that can do roadworthy tests for buses and trucks. So um, it's, it's a very happy day for us that we're able to bring this facility on board. We are two things that we are also hoping for, that the motor traffic units of the police would intensify their roadworthy checks because now buses should have no excuse not to have roadworthy uh, certificates because this facility here, as you can see, has been designed for buses and long vehicles. And also, number two, we want a policy that would require all commercial transport to have speed limits so that you can install a device that will cut the speed at the 100 kilometers that is the law says it should be. And then also, we have a, 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 a state-of-the-art driving school, and, and drivers should be required to come here and get a proper training, because the driver is the person holding the vehicle, and the training for the driver is the first line of defense. And the second line is the mechanical limit on speed. And if that is done, and the vehicles are checked regularly by a facility like this, the, 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 deaths, the accidents and the deaths will come down dramatically. And that's it for now. Up next is business. Sandra is standing by with more stories. Stay with us. Hello again and let's do more business news. The Chamber of Pharmacy Ghana and the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association of Ghana threatened to withdraw supplies to regional medical stores and health facilities funded by the National Health Insurance Authority if they fail to honor their indebtedness to its members. According to the groups, the public health facilities owed their members 12 months of pharmaceutical supplies. Joining me via Zone is the Executive Secretary of the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, Lucia Adai, for more on this development. Thanks so much for your time this evening, Lucia. Thank you so much for inviting me. Good evening to your cherished viewers. Great. So effective July 1 is the deadline for payment. If not, you're going to withdraw your services. How much are we talking about here? Okay, so before we go into the details, I believe that it's very important to put this in perspective. Right. So there are some of these regional medical stores that are owing us over 300 million um, CDs. And they've been owing us for over 12 months. So what is happening is that um, Ministry of Finance gives some money to the NHIS, and then the NHI gives the money to these health facilities. And for some of the regional medical stores, they get their funding from government. Mm. But some of them have become rec recalcitrant. So what they are doing is that they don't pay us our money, and they always expect you to actually supply more and more. So what we are saying is that for us to be able to supply, is either you pay for your old debt, or you give us some form of bank guarantee. Mm. Because we can't keep supplying you, we already have a lot of challenges. Some of the companies are actually facing collapse. And I believe now more than ever that it's very important to safeguard the pharmaceutical industry. We know what is happening with COVID. We know that it's important to ensure that supply chain is actually very stable. Mm. So to have some of these um, organizations borrow money of up to 30% huge interest rate, bring in raw materials, manufacture, give you the products, and it takes you maybe a year or two to pay, I think it is not fair to some of the companies. So right. if we are saying that we want to support the companies and support the pharmaceutical industry, it is important that if you owe us, you pay. That's what we are saying. Yeah, we're Lucia. Saying we're not going to make sure that there are medicines available. We are going to make sure that medicines are available on the mm. open market 
and then people will be protected and safe. Right, Lucia, as a 300 million cities, you say that's quite a lot. Have you been, en been engaging these uh, um, institutions and what have they been telling you with difficulties as to why they can't pay you? So we've been engaging the institutions, the various stakeholders. This debt is uh, spanning for cumulatively over five years. Mm. So what happens is that you go to the facilities, they tell you that they have not received their monies from NHIS. Now, because there's no transparency in the system, it's difficult to track as to how much and when these facilities are actually paid. So they can, um, in effect, use the money for other things and then pay you when it's suitable to them, which is not fair. Uh. Because it's important to support the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmaceutical manufacturers, to ensure that we can always have medicines available and at affordable prices for the citizens of the country. Mm. I have heard this story before. It's not the first time you're going after them to pay you and threatening uh, to withdraw your services if they do not pay. But you say 12 months, one would say, okay, it's a lot, but it's also just one year. Have you considered the implications, especially when we're having to deal with, I mean, critical issue like COVID-19? Government is having to put a lot of money in there. Have you considered the implications on the country before um, issuing this threat? Okay, so I believe it's oh, important it's not to paint this picture that the companies are facing collapse. So we can either keep quiet and have some of the companies collapse, or we can speak up and then see what can be done. Uh. Now, more than one year, up to five years. So obviously, there's been a lot of engagement with various stakeholders. This is not the first time. But it's important that now that there's a pandemic, there should be that support for the industry. Because the industry is key. It's key. And so it's important to protect the pharmaceutical industry. Mm. And this is all we are asking for. And I believe there are other stakeholders that have come out to say that you can give us a stimulus package, but give us the money that you owe us first, and then you can speak of a stimulus package. Because at the end of the day, this is how much money you owe us. Mm. I assume that you are um, supplying some drugs that are being used for treatment for COVID-infected patients. And uh, is that likely not to be affected? No, that is likely not to be as affected. So what we are saying is that for medicines that will be paid for, for medicines for pandemic and all the likes, it will be available. So there will be medicines on the open market, cash and carry, be able to access it. But if there's a, a client who is recalcitrant, who is not paying us on time, then what we are saying is that it will be difficult to supply you effective first July because our businesses are going down. Mm. And we need these businesses to do well to be able to protect the citizens of the country. Right. So are you asking for the total debt? You said 300 million. Are you asking for all to be settled? Or if they make some part payments, you'll be able to make some consideration sort of? So the consideration is that if we are paid up to, uh, let's say, so the debt should not exceed three months. So if we are paid, we are in June, by July, we are paid up to about March, April. I think that should be fair for the companies to be able to survive. If not, it becomes difficult. And it means that we are going to have to borrow at high interest rates. And that means we are going further down. And most of the companies would collapse. We don't want that, I believe. So we believe that with this engagement and with these platforms, we'll be able to have some results. All right, I pray that they listen to you and make some payment and you also reconsider uh, your decision to withdraw services. Lucia, thanks so much for joining me Thank tonight on Business. We move on to other stories. And Ghana's railway sector is to receive a boost in the coming month as the Ministry signs an MOU with Global Railway Engineering Ghana for a $50 million investment. Sector Minister Joe Gatti explains that the agreement will ensure sharing and local assembling of rail products. The Ministry of Railways Development has signed an MOU with the Global Railway Engineer in Ghana for the establishment of a local assembly plant for railway equipment and wagons in Ghana. Sector Minister Joe Gatz explains the partnership will complement efforts in expanding Ghana's railway sector. Uh, this MOU gives them a, an exclusivity of four months. And within four months, we expect that they would have finished their necessary feasibility study and would have decided whether we intend to go ahead or not. The government of Ghana has responsibility under this MOU to provide facilities to give them information and to, provide, to give them facilities where they can assemble the plants. We will leave it to them to look at our facilities in Tema, the DMU workshop, our facilities in Iskadu, at location, and also our facilities in Takradi. After the four-month four, four exclusivity period, there's an opportunity to extend it further, depending on how far we've reached. 
Joy Business is learning the local assembly plant will enjoy an exclusivity of four months upon which the Global Railway Engineering Ghana embarks on a feasibility study. Dr. Jimin Heyman is director of the Global Railway Engineering Ghana. What we are trying to do is we want to bring everything here. Number one, assembling it here would create opportunities of employment here. And secondly, and probably the most important, is that we are thinking about technology transfer. So far, the government has injected a little over $1 billion to the expansion and rehabilitation of the Accra Tema and Accra and Sawam railway lines, seeking to build a network of over 3,500 kilometers. Just a little over $38 today. Here are the market figures in Commodity News. how we wrap up tonight on business. My name is Sandra S. And, I'm up. and you can get more news on our website, myjoinline.com forward slash business. Please stay home, stay safe, and stay beautiful. And thanks so much for watching. And it's now time for Johnny's Interactive. Of all the stories we've been doing, I see a lot of you are reacting to the Dodo Pepper so, uh, story brought to you by uh, Justice Beidou uh, from Inquanta. Uh, let me pick a few of the comments sent in. Mame Abna Edu says, uh, Ghanaian roads are made to be destroyed after a few years, so contractors can still go, uh, get work and money. Black man with black sense, we would day where we day. No, that's a sad one. Uh, unfortunate uh, state of affairs there. This one says, hashtag GM legacy, the political in there. Bernard Yemo Kwashi says, no one is wearing face masks in town, and you didn't report that. We did that story just before we brought you the Dodo Pepper, so... Uh, I'm sure if you watch, you saw that. Uh, so Majan says, even a railway constructed in months have been washed away by rain. So those accusing Mama should think about that. Okay. Uh, Kinsley says, can you listen to the natives of the area? Even potholes to this government refuse to cover. What at all can Nanado do right? Um, uh, Rikus, uh, Rikus also comments and says that I think the contractors have not done a good work. Just in four years after construction, we are seeing potholes. That Accra to Aflao Equas Road was uh, constructed in 2008, 2009, and it's still solid. Okay, you're referring to that road, and it's still, now, still solid with little or no potholes. Our Ghanaian contractors are failing us. And that is Eriko's there. Let's take this one from John. John says, and what's the essence of maintenance? Always useless politicking when action must be taken to maintain the road and keep them in good shape. Thank you, John, for your comments. Let's take the last one from Imano. I see the Imano says, this road is still looking uh, fresh in NDC Green Book, hashtag GM Legacy. And of course, the politics will continue on these uh, stories as we bring them to you. So that's it for joining us interactive, but that's it for our show tonight. Many thanks for your company. You find more stories when you log on to myjoinline.com and Ernest Mino. Enjoy the rest of our programs.